So we've talked about these different modes of inheritance. We've talked about Mendelian inheritance of these traits that are, uh, traits that are pretty strongly genetically determined. We've talked about the uh, polygenic inheritance that gives us more continuous expression. Um, when we're trying to determine whether traits are more strongly affected by genotype or the environment, um, you know, it, it, it brings up interesting kind of interplay of the genotype and the environment. So one's genotype sets kind of the limits or potentials for development or expression of a trait. Uh, genotypes though also interact with environments sometimes in quite uh, predictable ways, sometimes in ways that are much less predictable. Um, so we're going to talk about stature as an example of this. Stature of course is your skeletal height. We all recognize that there is a strong effect of genotype on stature. That is, if you've got parents and grandparents and siblings and aunts and uncles who are really, really tall, you run a much greater uh, likelihood of also being really, really tall. Similarly, if most of the people in your family are of uh, short stature, then you yourself have a higher likelihood of being of short stature. Um, but there's also a, a role of the environment in stature. So it's like genetic sets or your genotype sets the stage for what might be your maximum height potential, but environmental factors like uh, childhood nutrition, your health during development, and your work effort influence whether that height potential is achieved or not. And so there was a really interesting um, you know, kind of case study of, of uh, identical twins reared apart and one of the images that's widely used that I forgot to include on the slide um, is uh, two Chinese boys that had, had been put up for adoption. One had been adopted by a wealthy family, one had been adopted by a poor rural working class family um, and by the time they finished puberty they had a height difference of four to five inches. You know, that's a pretty sizable difference given that they had exactly identical genotypes. So the environment and particularly the environment that we have during growth and development critically affects um, how our height potential is expressed. And so, you know, in a state like New Mexico, where 42, I mean, Albuquerque alone, 42% of children in Albuquerque don't have food to eat when they're not at school. You know, we've got really, really high rates of what we call food insecurity. This should be um, of critical kind of social importance. This is a public health issue when we've got children that don't have access to food. So um, situations like this, examples like this, are absolutely applicable uh, even in our home state. For many traits, it's not really clear though what the effects of environment and um, genetics are, um, particularly as we get into traits that are uh, perhaps more complex in terms of polygenic inheritance or more um, able to be modulated by the environment. You know, when we talk about stature, it's got very strong heritability, highly her heritable, highly coded for by genetics, but our body weight doesn't, right? Our body weight certainly has a genetic component. And um, we all know that there are people who are thin no matter what they eat. We also know that there are people who are overweight no matter what they eat. Um, th so genetics certainly plays a role, but it's a lot more easily modulated or a lot more affected by differential environments. And so if we talk about body weight, um, generally if you eat more calories than you expend, you will gain weight, though um, our kind of metabolic functioning is influenced by the environment. For example, um, we have identified greater epigenetic effects on metabolism. Um, and the epigenetic effects are modulated by the intrauterine environment, though it's not even the uterine environment in which you yourself formed. Rather, it's the uterine environment in which the gamete that gave rise to you formed. So when we think about female reproduction, the gametes that, uh, that were responsible, the eggs that were responsible for you and your siblings were laid down when your mother was developing as an, a fetus in your grandmother's uterus. And so we get, for example, um, inherited trauma. Um, and one of those, the expressions of inherited trauma is through uh, having a, an adult metabolism that we characterize as calorie hoarding. So um, uh, one example of this is the 
uh, children of Holocaust or the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. The grandchildren of Holocaust survivors are much more likely to uh, have a metabolism that's calorie hoarding because of the extreme um, calorie restriction that was present in, in internment camps, concentration camps. So when we talk about epigenetic factors and how they affect um, the expression of genes, sometimes those traits can go back uh, farther generationally um, so that we see carryover or consistency across generations of environmental effects on genotypes. So, you know, that fascinates me. Uh, the reason it fascinates me is that I've got a metabolism that is calorie hoarding. Um, and one, you know, if you listen to traditional kind of diet and exercise advice, the conventional advice would be eat less, exercise more. Um, when I eat less, my body shifts into starvation mode and doesn't lose anything. Um, and so I've actually had more success with weight loss when I've uh, when I up my calories dramatically from like, you know, under 1200 calories a day to like 2200 calories a day. Now, it does matter what I eat. Um, I'll be more likely to lose weight if I'm eating a diet that's based on protein and fat and the only form of carbohydrates, uh, vegetable products versus like cereal grains and such. Um, something more along the lines of what we consider a modern uh, paleo diet or even a ketogenic diet. So, you know, it's, it's complicated, right? There are things that the people, the laity believe, are, are pretty strictly genetically determined that can have this really complex role of the environment at different stages of development. In general, Mendelian traits are much less likely to be in, influenced by the environment because they are a, a presence or absence, expressed or not, kind of condition versus those that are polygenic that have a continuum of expressions. And we also inherit mitochondrial DNA. Um, the mitochondria in our, our cells have several copies of a ring-shaped DNA molecule or chromosome. It is distinct from nuclear DNA. It contains about 40 genes that direct the conversion of energy within the cells. Um, and mitochondrial DNA is also subject to mutations. Some of these can cause certain genetic disorders that impair energy conversion. We don't have a great understanding of mitochondrial disease, but we do have the ability at least to recognize and diagnose mitochondrial disease disorders. Um, you only inherit your mitochondria from your mother, so theoretically they are perfect genetic copies of the DNA that's in your, your mother's mitochondria. Um, all of the variation that is present in mitochondrial DNA is due to mutation rather than um, the other functions that, uh, or other um, mechanisms by which variation can be introduced. And this is because mitochondria are not going to be subjected to, for example, sexual recombination or even so much gene flow if that gene flow is only of uh, one sex. So mitochondrial DNA can be incredibly useful for studying genetic change over time. We will talk about it in the coming weeks. Um, one of the things that we've determined with mitochondrial DNA, for example, is the degree of closeness evolutionarily between ourselves and um, Neanderthals. Uh, we share more mitochondrial DNA among other anatomically modern humans than we do at all with Neanderthals. Also, we can kind of look at the depth of time that we've lived on different continents. There are seven modern human mitochondrial lineages, but only four of those occur outside of Africa. All seven occur within Africa. So that helps us kind of narrow down the time frame um, at which point we left Africa um, as anatomically modern humans and traveled to the rest of the world. So we will revisit this idea of mitochondrial DNA. All of this brings us to what we call the modern synthesis or modern evolutionary theory. Uh, we began with the recognition that mutation and natural selection weren't opposing forces, but rather contrib both contributed to biological evolution. You know, we used to think that mutation was bad, natural selection was good, um, and nat you know that mutation was kind of running opposite or counter to any kind of directional evolution based on natural selection. Now we recognize that they work in tandem, that evolution is a two-stage process. The first involves the production and redistribution of variation. These are inherited differences 
among organisms. And so at this point, mutation is one of those mechanisms by which genetic variation originates. And then secondly, natural selection acts on that variation, leading to differential survival and or reproduction. So mutation is partly responsible for producing the variation that natural selection can act upon. Um, the fitting definition within the modern synthesis of evolution is change in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. Now remember, we are measuring the changing allele frequencies uh, at the population level. Evolution is not something that can happen within the individual per se, um, but rather is something that is a function of population levels. The allele frequencies are the percentage of all alleles at a locus that are accounted for, accounted for by one specific allele, and the gene pool represents all the genes that are shared by the reproductive members of a population. So the modern synthesis recognizes that we have to understand the mechanisms by which genetic variation arises. The first, of course, that we've talked about is mutation, which is defined as the imperfect copying of DNA strands. Species have underlying mutation rates, um, and of course different genes have different mutation rates. Those that are highly conserved are much less likely to see mutation, but in humans our underlying mutation rate is roughly 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 6 per gene per generation. This comes out to, uh, with 30,000 genes, uh, comes out to roughly one mutation per every three offspring, but we've talked about the fact that this doesn't result in X-Men. Right? It also doesn't result in certain death. We see um, most of us, out of having three offspring, we're not going to see some underlying genetic disease, or we're not going to see um, the evolution of mutant powers like flight or controlling the weather, right? And a lot of this is because of that redundancy in the genetic code. If you recall back to your work with the codon wheel, right? A lot of times we can change that third base in a codon and not change the uh, amino acid that that codon codes for. So we've got a lot of um, functional kind of neutrality of most of our genetic mutations. The second source of genetic variation is gene flow. This is the exchange of genes between populations. We often use the term migration as something that's synonymous or a proxy for gene flow, but we have to recognize that migration only refers to the movements of people, whereas gene flow implies interbreeding. Um, so migration in and of itself is not enough. You have to also interbreed once you've got new people introduced. Um, our human population movements have increased disproportionately in the last 500 years. We've gone from pretty slow, consistent rates of migration and interbreeding to the spread of European imperialism and colonialism, which re led to um, much more genetic admixture the world over. And so in modern times, there are very few of what we refer to as breeding isolates. Um, we do have these relatively uncontacted tribes like uh, the northern, uh, the ones on North Sentinel Island that killed that um, American missionary um, who decided to go ahead and try to uh, land on that island. Um, so there are a few rather isolated populations, but um, for most of our recent history, we've had a lot of genetic admixture. Um, and we can look at things like the admixture between African Americans and Europeans uh, as we compare places like Detroit versus Charleston that can help to demonstrate microevolutionary changes. So um, European genes represent about 20-25% of the genome of African Americans in uh, Detroit, whereas they only represent about 10% to 15% of the genome of African Americans in Charleston, and that has to do with different attitudes toward um, interracial marriage and reproduction. So, um, you know, historical events can shape these microevolutionary changes or processes. A third factor that introduces variation is genetic drift. This is that element of randomness. It's a function of population size and occurs solely 
because the population is small. Um, so we can play a, a mind game with the color of marbles that is really good at demonstrating genetic drift. So I have a bag of marbles. Five of those marbles are red, five of those marbles are blue. I would ask one of you to pick five marbles at random. Then we're going to double that to give us our next quote-unquote breeding population. So you know, I'll, I'll pretend, obviously, because we can't have that interplay right now, but I'll pretend I'm one of you and I'm going to say three red, two blue. So when we double that, that gives us a a population of six red marbles and four blue marbles. Again, I would ask somebody to pick five at random. This time you're going to pick four red, one blue. When we double that for our next generation, that gives us eight red marbles and two blue marbles. Now when we pick five at random, we are much more likely to only pick red marbles. So in a, as short as three generations, we've gone from an equal representation of red and blue marbles to a uh, fixation of red marbles. And, you know, when we think about whether that's adaptive or not. Well, the color of your marbles doesn't really influence your success at playing the game per se, right? It's going to be the size of your marbles. It's going to be whether they're perfectly round or not. It's going to be their density or hardness. Those are all going to be factors that influence how well you play marbles, not whether your marble is red or blue. So sometimes we can get fixation of traits that because they have fixed at a single expression, we think they are adaptive. Blue eyes are an example of this in Scandinavia, right? We've got this myth of the Swedish supermodel uh, who's tall and lanky, blonde and blue-eyed, um, when really that blue-eyed feature is a function of uh, what we call a founder effect. A founder effect is a particular kind of genetic drift. We see this in many human and non-human populations. It can occur when we've got a colonizing event, so a small band of founders leaves its parent group and forms a colony elsewhere. This is what is responsible for blue eyes in Scandinavia. It's because there were more blue-eyed individuals who moved into Scandinavia and by pure chance alone that resulted in a population that was near fixation. Over time uh, this establishes a new population. If you've only got mating within that population, then all of the group members will be descended from the original small group of founders. We see this among, um, for example, the Pennsylvania Amish, the Old Order Amish, that that source population was only about, oh, I'm trying to remember what the, the amount is, that source population was only about, um, it was like, what, 200 or so individuals um, that settled in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, so because of that founder effect, this particular population of Old Order Amish are more at risk for a high number of genetic disorders um, because they were disproportionately represented um, as recessive traits that, that were present in the founders. It doesn't have to be because of colonization, though. Founder effects can also occur because of population bottlenecks, where a large proportion of the population is wiped out, and then the population is reestablished from the smaller number who survived it. And so that is the likely explanation for the lack of variability that we see in modern-day cheetahs, for example. Cheetahs are incredibly inbred. They are, have a critically low level of genetic variability, and so that creates a conservation crisis because... Um, for species to be healthy, they need a good deal of genetic variation, and that's not going to happen with cheetahs. Um, so it's one of the effects where kind of some of the genetic engineering or genomic uh, uh, advances that we've made since the 1980s might be helpful. If we can find um, stored bones of uh, cheetahs that predate that population bottleneck, we might be able to reintroduce some variability into the cheetah population. Um, we can also, I mean, we see the evidence of some population bottlenecks in our own histories as well. You know, particularly we can see the effects of, um, of genocide, right? So uh, one of the reasons why um, there are, are uh, certain genetic disorders like uh, Tay-Sachs disease among um, Ashkenazi Jews is that a lot of their population variation was lost during the Holocaust, and they've also then had cultural practices that require marrying only within other Ashkenazi Jews. So um, there can be genocides or um, mass, you know, pandemics that cause uh, are caused by disease outbreaks, etc., that can leave um, significantly lower levels of genetic variation afterwards.
<clears throat> we also get a lot of genetic variation due to sexual recombination. Now, in one sense, we can get novel genetic material through what we call crossing over. As chromosomes line up during um, meiosis to form gametes, the homologous chromosomes can switch part of their um, part of their DNA or part of their structure, uh, resulting in an entirely new novel chromosome. Uh, and this is what's depicted in this picture right here. But we also, with sexual recombination, get novel combinations of alleles. And so this is really important with respect to um, the evolution of immunity, for example, among um, you know, even human populations, that sexual recombination allows us to produce offspring that are genetically distinct from one another, particularly if we seek new and novel genetic input. So um, one of the things that we find is that as we compare across uh, human populations around the globe, right, uh, we can see a different degree um, or kind of selection pressure favoring what we consider to be genetic novelty. And so among um, the one area where this is of particular importance is with host pathogen interactions. So when we think about the role that disease plays on um, pair bonding and um, what we call extra pair copulations, in areas where uh, there's a higher prevalence of pathogens, we also find a higher likelihood of extra pair copulation or extra pair uh, paternity. That is that um, women make a conscious choice when they're in high pathogen areas to sire children by different fathers um, because what that does is introduces more genetic variability into their offspring such that maybe one of them or maybe all of them will be better able to uh, fight off the future mutations of uh, diseases. And so pathogen load is tightly tied to things like marital stability uh, or marital instability in that case. Um, it's also been proposed, there's a theory that was uh, proposed by Randy Thornhill and Corey Fincher, who were, uh, Corey Fincher was Randy Thornhill's uh, grad student here in, uh, or here in Albuquerque at UNM, and uh, it's called the parasite wedge theory, and they went so far as to tie pathogen load to things like political conservatism and liberalism, that uh, populations in high pathogen areas are much more likely to be more politically conservative because by being open to outsiders you run the likelihood that or you have the likelihood that you're going to bring diseases into your group that your group doesn't have the ability to fight. Um, now I mean that to, in my mind is more of a stretch that we can uh, correlate political conservativeness to um, historic patterns of pathogens but you know there is pathogens play a huge role in our evolutionary history and we do need genetic variation to be able to kind of fight future pathogen loads because pathogens can evolve so much faster than we can. As we talk about the evolutionary processes, right, we've got the introduction of variation and then natural selection operates on that variation. We've got to talk about two ends of a continuum um, and a lot of people that follow creation science or intelligent design will be quick to accept the first of these, or microevolution, but not willing to accept the second of these, or macroevolution. Uh, there was a book years ago called Darwin's Black Box that kind of uh, dichotomized um, micro and macroevolution as distinct processes. Um, but really, they're not. They just represent two ends of a continuum of evolutionary change. So microevolution is our small-scale genetic changes in a population or species over a few, several, or many generations without speciation. This is what we were already, already referring to as um, phyletic evolution. Um, and so we've got down at the bottom here the picture of the peppered moth. Um, that uh, prior to um, industrial revolution, of course, trees were covered with lichens, they were gray and speckled. That is the phenotype of the moth on the right. So prior to the industrial revolution, birds would predate upon melanistic moths. After 
industrialization when there were soot deposits on um, the trees then birds couldn't see the melanistic moths and um, more preferentially predated upon the speckled moths um, thus we have a pretty abrupt population shift in the allele frequencies um, <clears throat> Most people don't have an ethical problem with microevolution, um, but it, it's the speciation events that tend to draw more ire. Um, so that's what we have depicted on the right is macroevolution, uh, where we've got larger uh, scale evolutionary changes, more significant genetic changes in a population or a species over a longer time period. This then results in speciation. Um, Macroevolution happens for the very same reasons that microevolution happens, that we've got some environmental change that changes the kind of path of natural selection such that two populations evolve to be different. And that's what's pictured on the right. This shows the Isthmus of Panama prior to about three million years ago we only had one species of snapping shrimp and that species lived in the sea that was between North and South America. Three million years ago the Isthmus of Panama arose and it separated out the North or the uh, Atlantic snapping shrimp from the Pacific snapping shrimp. When you look at the pictures of the shrimp you see that both sides of the Isthmus have one front claw that is markedly bigger. This is their snapping claw. Uh, all of those on the Atlantic side, um, or most of those on the Atlantic side, there's that one at the end there that's a little bit different. Um, but the Atlantic side is characterized by right-handedness, that is the front right um, claw is the one that's uh, elaborated, whereas those on the Pacific side are left-handed. It is the front left claw that is elaborated. So we see there's not really a difference in um, the adaptive nature. It doesn't really matter, for example, which of the claws is elaborated or larger. It just matters that you have one that is. And so uh, that kind of function of random genetic drift that led to right-handedness because of a founder effect uh, on at the Atlantic side and left-handedness on the Pacific side. Now you might be thinking, okay, I'm not even really all that, I don't find this controversial, right? It's no big deal to me that the rising of the isthmus between um, the Atlantic and Pacific, you know, with respect to um, Panama, it resulted in different speciation or different species on each side, but people didn't evolve. Well, that's where we're going to go from here, right? We're going to talk about the reason that you need to understand the um, the role or the mechanisms of genetic evolution from a microevolutionary standpoint is so that you can apply those same principles to a macroevolutionary standpoint. So we're going to talk over the coming weeks about human evolution um, and, you know, firstly primate evolution, and um, we're going to see that it's the same principles. Uh, there's going to be a big role, for example, of dietary changes that are driven by environmental changes. For example, primates evolved because 65 million years ago the dinosaurs were wiped out and with them a lot of the coniferous plants that the dinosaurs ate. And so this opened up the stage for the evolution of angiosperms which produce fruit. Um, and guess what primates evolved to eat? Well, they evolved to eat fruit. So dietary shifts lead to um, a rapid diversification and speciation events. Similarly, we're going to talk about how six to eight million years ago the African forests were shrinking because the climate was drying out and this led to the spread of the African savanna, which changed the very nature of the plant resources that were available. We went from plants having most of their biomass above ground in the form of tall trees in the canopy to plants having most of their biomass below ground in the form of um, systems of roots and tubers. And so, you know, if you've ever had to dig up a yucca, you need a crane to do it. They can have a 30-foot tap root. So the changing nature of resources changed the selection pressures and changed the direction that elect, uh, that evolution then took and our large brains are due in part um, actually you know quite a bit uh, to the fact that there were these environmental changes that changed the direction of natural selection so understanding the mechanisms that give rise to microevolution allow you to better understand the process of speciation and it happened for people just as it did for other primates.
So that brings up this idea that natural selection is directional. For adaptation and evolution to occur, the gene pool must change in a specific direction rather than it just being all random and, and like pendulous from one extreme expression to another. Some alleles need to consistently become more common. Natural selection needs to be the one factor that can cause directional change in allele frequency relative to specific environmental pressures. So what happens first is the environment changes. This changes the selection pressures. Ultimately, the allelic frequencies will also change. We're going to talk about the emergence of one particular trait, and that is sickle cell anemia. Um, we have... And we, we know that expression of sickle cell anemia is often incompatible with a long life. Um, that normally these individuals would die at least by about the age of 45. Um, often they would die as children. They would have cardiovascular disease. They would have um, heart attacks at really young ages. Um, and, and this is due to this possession of this uh, hemoglobin S allele. Uh, the hemoglobin S allele is what causes the sickle shape. And so if you look at the diagram at the bottom, um, the bottom picture shows you a sickled blood cell. It, it looks like a crescent moon, right? Normal blood cells look more like donuts. Uh, and we call that hemoglobin A. Um, why do we see sickle cell anemia? It's so detrimental when an individual inherits two sickle cell uh, genes or two sickle cell alleles uh, and it causes its disease expression. Well, we've got variability across the world in the prevalence of sickle cell anemia. In U.S. populations, it's much more likely among African Americans than it is among whites or European Americans. Um, we see a high prevalence of it in equatorial regions of Africa. We also see a high prevalence of a similar sort of trait in Southeast Asia. And the expression or the con conservation of the sickle cell allele occurs because of malaria. So um, in areas where malaria is prevalent, uh, being heterozygous for hemoglobin is useful um, because the um, the kind of sporozytes uh, from the malaria uh, bacterium <coughs> can't infect the sickled blood cells. They can only affect the normal blood cells. Uh, and so in this context, if you have one allele for regular hemoglobin, one allele for sickle hemoglobin, then you're fine as long as you stay at low elevation. But in contexts where uh, oxygen becomes thin, um, higher elevation, etc., you're more likely to see some of your blood cells sickle. Um, and that's, you know, it's this sickling nature that deals with whether the malaria um, kind of reproductive cells can infect you or not. So in these populations, having that heterozygous condition leads to innate malarial resistance or immunity. So you're much less likely to die from malaria. Well, malaria is one of the leading causes of death for uh, children under five in the tropics. It's a devastating disease. And so in this context, we see as much as 20% of the population expressing sickle cell anemia. Why? Well, because you've got this advantage of being a heterozygote. So if two heterozygotes reproduce, some of their children are necessarily going to express that recessive condition of full-blown sickle cell anemia. So the preservation of what we call sickle cell trait, which is that heterozygous condition, one normal hemoglobin and one sickle hemoglobin allele, um, is what then results in a higher prevalence of uh, full-blown sickle cell anemia. So what what is this illustrating? Well, this is basically showing us that the development of um, genetic disorders or any kind of, you know, the prevalence of factors that favor alleles that we might view as detrimental can be very complex. And we can have this interplay between environmental factors. In this case, it is the uh, presence of malaria um, that favors the retention of um, a costly allele or a, a dangerous recessive allele um, in the population at relatively high numbers. That's why we see um, people of African descent with disproportionately less or disproportionately higher likelihood of expressing sickle cell anemia. So the long and short of it is that the genetic expression or that the this interaction by which 
genotype produces phenotype and the heritability of certain traits is increasingly complex um, and we can't always disentangle the effects of the environment from um, genetics um, and that you know we've got both Mendelian inheritance principles and um, polygenic inheritance uh, and expression of genotypes and this ever increasing role that the environment plays. So it, it's really hard to determine what exactly is genetically based and what exactly is environmentally based. So in summary, you know, recall Gregor Mendel and his principles of segregation and, and independent assortment recognize uh, dominance and recessiveness as these discrete units and the difference between genotype and phenotype. Understand how the Mendelian principles then apply during meiosis to the segregation of chromosomes and the alleles they carry. Understand the modern evolutionary synthesis, which combines natural selection with Mendel's principles of inheritance, uh, and then also the experimental evidence that gives us some insight into mutation. Uh, recognize that evolution is now seen as a two-stage process, where the first stage is the production of and redistribution of variation, and that variation can come from mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, or recombination. And the second stage is natural selection operating on that accumulated genetic variation. Um, so mutation is not always bad, it's just a, another uh, mechanism by which variation can be introduced into our genome. And then recognize that natural selection quite often is the central determining factor that influences the long-term direction of evolutionary change. Um, you know, when we talk about directional selection, um, we have to also recognize that there's often two other kind of mechanisms. One is stabilizing selection, that which favors the mean expression um, and restricts the variation, and then also disruptive selection, where the two ends of the distribution are favored, the two extreme phenotypes are favored, but the median expression is not. And so, you know, what we talk about with uh, the preservation of the sickle cell allele for hemoglobin, um, we're talking about particularly uh, um, what's called a genetic polymorphism um, and the directional favoring in populations then that have a high uh, kind of prevalence of malaria.